This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is the 1967 British television show, The Prisoner. I have two people who will speak about it and why it is great. The subject is the 1967 UK series, The Prisoner. I'll be talking about it with Fiona Moore and Dean Mata. As I usually like to do, I want to give my guests a chance to introduce themselves and their interest in the subject matter. Uh, so let me start with you, Fiona. Uh, who are you? Uh, what do you do? And what was your introduction to The Prisoner? Oh, uh, thank you, Dan. Um, I'm a professor at uh, Royal Holloway University of London. Um, yes, um, I'm from Canada, but I've uh, lived in the UK for uh, 25 years. Um, my uh, interest, well, let's start with the introduction first and then the interest. Um, I'd always heard about The Prisoner um, because I've been um, interested for a long time in television and television history. You know, as a teenager, I uh, found out about uh, old TV series, started collecting them, going to screenings, things like that. And people always talked about The Prisoner, but I didn't manage to see it till graduate school, at which point the penny dropped. And I was like, oh, good heavens, this is fantastic. This is uh, this is taking television to a new level, and it's taking it uh, to a new level at a time when, uh, you know, most television was still black and white. And um, so as things progressed, though, my interest in uh, television became a, a bit more than a hobby. And I started actually writing uh, first articles and then guidebooks about uh, television series. And um, after uh, my uh, co-authored book with Alan Stevens uh, on uh, the uh, 1970s series, Blake Seven um, became a bit of a hit. Uh, the publisher uh, offered us a choice of which series to do next. And of course, uh, we jumped at the chance to do The Prisoner. So that was great. We got to spend um, several years, uh, you know, act up and on as it happened, researching, uh, going to locations, uh, uh, finding people to interview and all that. And uh, so, um, yeah, so that was my uh, introduction and then kind of my first, my, uh, my full immersion into The Prisoner. And I just was looking up before we did the show. Actually, the show made its world premiere in Canada. So you didn't see it then, though. No, I was I was too young at the time. Well, it was in 1967. I was uh, uh, too young at the time is a bit of an understatement. My father had only just emigrated to Canada, and my mother was still in uh, university. So, uh, um, but yeah, it is uh, something that I think of as a little bit, yeah, cool. But its uh, first uh, broadcast was actually in Canada, not uh, and not the UK. And you do have a website called what a doctor of many things. A doctor of many things, yes. And uh, on that website, I uh, frequently post about science fiction, science fiction television, uh, I write sometimes serious essays about things like the use of colour and symbolism, and sometimes uh, silly ones, like, for instance, I'm currently in the middle of a series reviewing The Star Lost, which is a masterclass in what you shouldn't do on television. I was actually, but, I, I actually had that up on that I, it, a couple of years ago. I rewatched it for the first time since its initial run. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, bad budget, but some really good ideas and some good actors. Uh, yeah, but. yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what I'd say about it. You know, it had... Um, Really great ideas. You know, I repeatedly find myself saying over and over in a different series, this would make a very good story. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, and uh, some of the ca the guest cast are just fantastic, you know. Yeah. But uh, the problem is that there are some decisions taken otherwise that mm. uh, really let the series down. And unfortunately, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dean Mata is my other guest. Uh, Dean, if you could give a little background about yourself as well as your introduction to The Prisoner. Well, um, I'm a graphic novelist by trade. Um, I worked for Marvel and DC and Dark Horse. Um, and I've been at it for several several years, most of my adult life, in fact. I'm an illustrator and writer uh, and designer. Uh, uh, work, uh, currently, uh, uh, my series, Mr. X, is, is published by Dark Horse. Uh, that was a big hit uh, in the comic book that this year back in the 80s, and it was influenced by the art course in 2002. Um, my introduction to prisoner, I went to high school in Canada, and uh, I saw the, uh, the, uh, the season of Christmas uh, uh, there uh, at the time when I was in high school. 
I was a big fan of uh, James Bond and the Man from Uncle and the Spy series. Uh, and, and why well, jump the chance? I love secret agents, uh, as it was called in the States. Uh, and uh, that was my introduction. But uh, where I come into it was in uh, 1988, uh, DC Comics approached me to uh, do a comic book uh, interpretation of Prisoner. Uh, uh, and uh, I jumped at the chance. Uh, and I, we got the authorization from both uh, ICC and Patrick McGowan and uh, also Leah McKern. And uh, um, the uh, village of Port Miriam, where the series of films uh, to uh, to adapt uh, the show into a uh, council form. Uh, I chose not to adapt any of the episodes. I chose to uh, actually do a sequel that took place 20 years after the uh, the events of the original series. And uh, that came out as a four-issue graphic novel series. It was somebody collected his book and it was just reissued uh, about two years ago by Titan Books in the UK. Uh, and the, the collected edition under the title Shattered Vicious. Uh, and uh, I still uh, enjoy talking about the show and my experiences with, uh, with uh, ICC and the, uh, uh, the people involved. So, Dean, let me ask, uh, uh, Danger Man, as it was originally known in the UK, became Secret Agent Man and had the you know, Secret Agent Man, uh, was a minor hit for here in the US in the early mid-60s. Uh, Danger Man is an interesting show because the first season, uh, and it, it's a spy thriller show, uh, is only half hour. And it's interesting to see because it's very rare in the United States to see dramas that are under an hour. I mean, for the most of my lifetime, I was born in 65, dramas were 60 minutes. It was sitcoms that were always a half hour. Um, uh, that first season, though, was like 30-something episodes, uh, half hours. Then it came back for a second season. It went to a full hour. And then it was on and off two um, wonky little seasons, too, that were also uh, an hour. So... Um, let me ask you first, uh, talk a little bit about Danger Man and then its eventual connection to uh, The Later Prisoner, for those who don't well, know. Well, Danger Man was um, a spy show where um, and Patrick Goon played uh, an agent and then John Drake, who worked for, uh, we assume, MI5, the Secret Service. Uh, and it was basically an adventure of uh, Series that you know took off partly where uh, James Bond uh, audiences uh, uh, were looking for uh, you know something on TV to watch, uh, and uh, it's uh, like like I say I I watched Cheap Provision in, in uh, Canada uh, and, and also the U.S. when I was living in the U.S. at the time. Uh, uh, its connection to the secret to uh, uh, the prisoner was that that um, woman who employed number six in the prisoner, and he was uh, supposedly working for a top secret organization when he resigned and was uh, kidnapped and uh, taken to the, to the village, uh, which was some kind of uh, something between a, a a holiday resort and a prison or war camp. Uh, it was a very odd uh, uh, scenario. And often uh, people wonder uh, and often ask both, uh, well, I've asked anybody to talk about it, whether uh, John Drake in the secret agent of Danger Man was, uh, was number six because they never learned his name. In the prisoner, he's always simply referred to as number six, uh, and he did work for a secret organization. It's, it's unclear whether it's MI5 or, or some other clandestine organization. Um, but 
for that's for the connection to two series bars. Let me let me ask you, Fiona, have you seen any of the Danger Man episodes? Oh gosh, yes. In fact, when we were writing the book, Alan and I watched the whole lot, and yeah. uh, we actually really wanted to do a, a Danger Man, a, a guidebook to Danger Man, but uh, our, uh, as well, but our publisher uh, told us not to because uh, he didn't think it would get as big an audience, and uh, yeah. which is a shame, really, because there's a lot to love about Danger Man. Yeah, it's an excellent show. Yeah, we did try and tackle the question of uh, is the prisoner Drake, and kind of came to the conclusion that it's hard to say either way. I mean, uh, McGowan, you know, famously asserted that he wasn't. And in fact, uh, Jean Marie Stein, the author of one of the tie-ins, said that she deliberately put in uh, into the tie-in novel that uh, the prisoner was Drake just to see if McGowan or anyone associated with him was reading the tie-ins. But the point is, it's kind of, um, you know, there are some hints that he is, there are some hints that he isn't. I mean, the, the, at its... Um, at his best, I think Danger Man could get very uh, close to the prisoner. You know, there are some very strange and surreal episodes, and there are some episodes that uh, tackle issues, uh, you know, it kind of go goes above the, and beyond the James Bond things and tackles, uh, uh, you know, certain issues in uh, ways that I don't think James Bond would have dared. And it also, I mean, because, I mean, McGowan was offered the role of Bond, but t turned it down because he didn't like the misogyny or the uh, violence. And so... In some ways, uh, a lot of Danger Men can be seen as a way of doing a uh, Bond adjacent series, but one where the agent's respectful to women and where, uh, you know, his first port of call isn't always a gun. You know, sometimes it's a second or third port of call, but he uh, generally tries to solve things through his uh, his wits and, uh, you know, his uh, and solving things. Well, we'll get to the Drake prisoner uh, number yeah. six thing uh, towards the end when we get to go through some of the episodes. But one of the things that you mentioned, yeah, uh, the, the lack of uh, use of guns. Uh, we don't yeah. see him being a womanizer. And one of the other things that's almost a direct uh, precursor to the prisoner is the episode where uh, Drake has to go to Russia, the, the Soviet Union, and he's in one of those uh, westernized villages where they're, where they're making moles. Uh, uh, I forget the name of the episode, but that's that's one that's often seen as a precursor to the prisoner. Uh, what was mm. the name of that episode? Do you recall? Twenty three. Okay. Twenty three. Yeah. But there's also uh, the ubiquitous Mister Lovegrove, which right. is uh, uh, the one where uh, one one's basically a dream story, but yeah. uh, as a result, everything goes like completely strange and surreal and prisoner esque, and uh, the guy who plays Q turns up, um, you know, and uh, yeah. You know, and then you've got uh, Dangerous Secret, where uh, you know you've got the a um, scientist who goes on the run rather than uh, uh, you know let his work be used for evil, and uh, you know the uh, different uh, governments are kind of trying to break him down and uh, find out uh, what he knows, and so uh, you know it's not directly prisoner esque, but thematically you know you can sort of see where where things are going. So, Dean, uh, let's talk about the opening of each of the episodes. There are only 17 episodes. The first episode, we get what later becomes the standard opening for all, but maybe one or two of the later episodes uh, where we see, you know, in his famous little sports car, uh, the prisoner drives, he goes home, a man with an umbrella comes in, shoots some kind of knockout gas into his apartment, and then he wakes up in the village, and then we get the, you know, uh, who is number one and you know you see him running and you, you you know you get all the iconic imagery in the first minute of the intro um uh, what is your take on uh that standard intro and how does it affect the actual you know uh each episode or, or the series as a whole well each um as i said each episode could almost um uh, could almost be viewed separately uh as the first day or the second week or something early on. Um, so the introduction was necessary and set up for that. Um, when I was doing graphic novel, I tried to use images from the uh, from the opening, uh, such as him and his bullet driving down the, uh, the enemy highway, the storm clouds, uh, marching into the office and uh, uh, you know, slamming his resignation down his desk with his superior. Uh, I try to use and echo those images in, in my draft novel for um, uh, for my purposes. Uh, but uh, 
the, the staff was necessary because the situation was so surreal uh, when, when, he, when he wakes up in the middle. It has to, it has to become very apparent that it is unlike any place he's ever been, unlike any place we've been or familiar with. And it's, it's interesting because the photo that's X'd out in the opening is a photo of John Drake from Danger Man. Yeah. Sort of. <laughs> it's a publicity still of Patrick McGowan taken around the time of Danger Man. So uh, <laughs> arguably it could be taken as Drake or arguably if you want to argue the other side of it, you could say it's, uh, it's uh, a still of McGowan. So let's let's talk about the episodes. There's a lot of controversy about the 17 episodes, and there's really only three episodes that are sort of locked into place. Arrival, the opening, the penultimate episode, and then the final episode, which are basically a, a two-hour episode sort of, uh, you know, because it, it actually continues. But one of the interesting things is uh, back in days of yore when this was coming out, most television, at least in the U.S., was episodic, self-contained. Star Trek, you know, there might be a rare reference back. Uh, uh, a lot of most uh, situation comedies were totally episodic. Now in the last 15, 20 years here in the U.S. at least, even, you know, sitcoms are becoming more serialized. Yet this is somewhere in, in, in between because it doesn't really matter where those other 14 episodes necessarily go. I mean, yes, some of them refer back here or there, but you could watch them in virtually any order and then just have the, the three episodes at the beginning and end bracketing them. Um, what is your take on the episode order, Fiona? Okay, well, uh, one of the things that makes The Prisoner such a unique series is that it actually has four episode twos uh, because uh, four people were commissioned to write uh, episode two at the same time. And so uh, in some ways it makes it impossible to uh, pin down an order for The Prisoner because... Uh, you could, uh, as you said, you could watch them in any order, but at the same time, there are several episodes which are written as if they were the second in the series. Mm. So, you know, you can rationalize it in various ways. I mean, the prisoner gets his memory wiped a lot and uh, canonically, so it could be that uh, it's, uh, you know, that's what's happening. It could be that things are jumping about in time, that there's multiple timelines. There is evidence that the prisoner's got duplicates. So, yeah, I mean, uh, there's been a lot of uh, very good essays written arguing for one um, episode order over another. And, uh, you know, my own feeling on it is really that uh, you need to suit yourself, you know, that um, it's impossible to argue. Apart from, as you said, those three locked in episodes, it's impossible to argue for one order or another. And you need to just kind of, um, you know, develop an order that uh, suits you. But as you said, that's... Uh, that is another thing that makes it very unique for the time. Um, possibly not the first and last episode being rigid because, uh, you know, the one time in episodic series when you can make any changes to the cast or the lineup is in the opening episode or the fi uh, final episode of the season. You know, if you uh, watch Star Trek, you know, kind of the point at which, you know, kind of a Chekhov comes in and Yeoman Rand disappears and all that. It's always, you know, like, ah, oh, yes, season opener, you know. Um, so there, there's something a bit there, but uh, the fact that the uh, final, penultimate episode ties in and also the fact that since it is just 17 episodes, I mean, it's not a syndicatable length. I mean, this was uh, of tremendous concern to uh, ITC at the time. They wanted 22 episodes so it could go into syndication and it couldn't and uh, at only 17. But, um, you know, because it's just this one self-contained document, uh, those first and final two episodes matter. They really do matter. Uh, Dean, let's talk about the numbered characters. Uh, number one is the putative boss, and we'll get to him, her, it at the end. Number two is the rotating de facto, I guess, manager of the village. Uh, and then our hero is number six, whether he's Drake or not, number six. Uh, is there any particular significance? Because other than those three numbers, all the other numbers seem rather, you know, haphazard. I don't, I don't think they get into four digits. I think the highest is a hundred and something that we see. What is the significance of the numbers, Dean? Well, I don't know that there is any. Uh, uh, it's I, I didn't interpret any. To the numbers that they had. 
as you say, that uh, it seems very arbitrary choosing the dumpsters of the other inmates of the village. Um, and oftentimes, it, you know, the inmates, uh, you know, was ambiguous as to whether they were visitors or prisoners or uh, cooperative citizens uh, who had made their home there. Uh, so the number system seems to, to me anyway, seems to be arbitrary. And uh, as you said, the, the rotating wards of the village, the number two, uh, it, it always seems to uh, harken back to the question, the constant question of who is number one. And that question is, uh, you know, is never really addressed until the, until the final episode. Um, Fiona, let, let me talk about Rover, uh, the giant white uh, uh, gaseous balloon or whatever it, it's supposed to be. I thought, you know, people who've read up on the show know that they were trying to get all kinds of contraptions to be the uh, Rover. And then they just simply one day one of the production people saw, I guess, a, a downed balloon. Um, but it, to me, it's brilliant, especially when the thing like, you know, swallows and the, you see the face pressing through uh, the plastic what is your take on Rover? Yeah, well, I mean, it almost seems like it was made for it, you know, uh, though, I mean, if you look at the, um, you know, the surviving footage of the contraption, it also would have picked up on village imagery, but uh, it just seems to fit so neatly into place, having a giant bubble, you know, fits in with the circular imagery, the circular white mm -hmm. badges, the wheel of the penny farthing. But it's also, I mean, if I can, you know, start going academic, <laughs> Go the symbolism of Rover is just magnificent, you know, just... When you're taught a series that is questioning your identity and, you know, asking about what it is to be a person, you know, that having this, uh, the force, the symbol of oppression be this giant blank, nothing, a zero, a literal zero that erases you as it comes down on you. And there are some things that it does, like there's one episode where, uh, you know, the prisoner uh, uh, blunders into a room and finds a group of people watching Rover as if it was television. And that sort of, you know, gives another symbolic uh, clue, if you like, to the meaning of Rover. You know, is it the media? Is it something that's kind of showing us what to be and yet reflecting us back and is also at the same time, you know, ultimately empty, you know, and if we fight against it, it smothers us. So, uh, so yeah. And also you've got kind of, the, as I say, you know, it starts to recur over and over. You get... Uh, you know, the, uh, the bubbles of the lava lamps that are, uh, you know, in uh, number two's display, and even number two himself, went, or herself, it comes out of the, uh, the ground in a big circular chair, common in the 60s. But yeah, you know, uh, you start to question, uh, you know, where uh, Rover ends, number two begins, and is, uh, you know, Rover kind of the uh, symbolic embodiment of the village, this giant blank identity erasing and yet identity conferring thing that uh, you know comes that comes out of the sea and uh, engulfs everything. Um, Dean, as far as I can recall, the only two characters that I don't know if they have numbers or badges in the, my mind's recall, but that are called something other than a number uh, is the butler, the little midget uh, or dwarf, and then the controller, the fellow with eyeglasses who is you know in charge of the control room and can see everything. Um, is what is your take on those two characters? Are they symbolic of anything? Um, I don't know if they're symbolic. Of anything. I know that the the, the butler just as an end to add to that British aristocracy uh, 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 flavor that they're kind of uh, devastating the village. Uh, uh, but other than that, I don't, uh, I've never interpreted any symbolism. So since maybe Fiona has some ideas on that. Uh, Fiona, do you have any uh, thoughts on those two characters, the controller and the butler? Um, yeah, well, as uh, Dean said, you know, uh, they're, uh, you know, they sort of fit in, if you like, as, um, you know, archetypes, role, you know, symbols of, uh, authority in a sense but you know for instance how why you know the butler you know the butler uh, is uh, somebody who's in a position of uh, deference if you like he's a servant he's small he's physically small and yet also uh, 
you know, he is this eerie, silent presence, a little like Rover, actually. And again, the original Rover was going to be black and white striped, like, uh, you know, recalling the butler's uniform. So uh, as with Rover, you've kind of got this uh, symbol of, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the village, you know, kind of unassuming and yet ubiquitous. And you got to ask yourself, uh, uh, you know, what's he know? What, in, at the end, he's one of the three people that escapes the village, you know? Why? You know, why, why is he chosen? And as for the controller, well, you know, you've kind of got this imagery of uh, technical sophistication. And I love the control set, you know, the seesawed cameras, you know, the circular room. I mean, it recalls supervillains uh, layers, yeah. but at the same time, it also looks like a, uh, a TV production office. So, uh, again, you know, starting to elide... Uh, the uh, the media with uh, surveillance with e with, and with megalomania so uh, you know and, and yet in the middle of it there's uh, this uh, banal person you know controlling it all yeah and also Leah's later the Truman Show with Jim Carrey has yeah. very prisoner esque things with the sky and he gets to the end of the ocean there and it, it's locked in uh, it's interesting too. Uh, you mentioned the butler, but the controller is also one of the three characters: the prisoner, the butler, and the controller. That basically survives uh, at the mm -hmm. end. He's the one yeah. who leads him down there. Whereas most of the number twos seem to bite the bullet, uh, except the resurrected yeah. Leo McKern too. Um, yeah, fair point. You know, you've got the, the the archetypes are the ones who survive. You know, it's the uh, the middle manager. You know, the civil servant, the one who's between. Uh, uh, the butler and number one, you know, who uh, who disappears. So, Dean, I want to start talking about uh, the episodes, some of the episodes. You don't have to go through all of them. But uh, uh, as we mentioned earlier, there's basically three that are locked in. The first one, Arrival, and then the penultimate and final episode. Um, it, as you look at the other 14 episodes, are there two or three that you think are more key than the other if you want to if one wants to look at this as sort of uh, a rubik's cube type puzzle that needs solving what what's happening uh, is there which episodes stand out to you or just stand out to you in any way well the, the one episode you seem to stand out to myself and or to most other people for the challenge of big ben uh where the prisoners um uh escaped from the village it makes us way back to London. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, the, the entire episode, the machinations she has to go through to get there. And, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a, you know, uh, an adventure. And it's, it's almost, you almost think that he's, he's beaten, he's beaten the, uh, the people that run the village at their own game uh, until the, the Final part of the episode where it's revealed it was all a charade on their part, uh, another effort to break him and get his information. But when uh, it chimes a bit down, it was just beyond tape recording, uh, and he realizes he's, he's in a studio in the village. Uh, that was one of my favorite episodes. Uh, the, um, another one. The one that often gets the most common is uh, Living in Harmony, which is there's kind of a fantasia episode which takes place in the, you know, uh, in the, in the American West. Uh, and it's a sort of a send up of American West, and at least in part, uh, it, it has a lot of uh, other overtones to it. But, um, those two uh, uh, are my favorite. And then the, the girl who is deaf uh, was another uh, one that uh, stood out for me. And uh, the one I forget the name of the episode, uh, John can probably uh, speak better to speak, but where he, he runs for mayor of the village yeah. and uh, or decides to run for mayor of the village. He, he, uh, to try to take matters into his own hands and them at their own game. Fiona, what's uh, what are some of the episodes that you think are key? Okay, yeah, well, you know, yeah, I um, also uh, quite like uh, living in harmony and free for all. Um, you know, and one of the things I'd add to uh, your excellent analysis, Dean, is that uh, I think uh, uh, living in harmony shows the uh, 
uh, and the girl who was deaf, to some extent, also show the flexibility of the format, you know, so, uh, that you could uh, put the prisoner in uh, any format from, uh, you know, uh, a Western to a romance to a uh, sailing story to a space opera. And, uh, you know, you would still get uh, the same themes, the same story. But also I'd like to add others. I mean, one story I uh, think is really um, key and really impressive is uh, um, uh, uh, da uh, is, uh, Dance of the Dead, you yeah. know, which almost wound up on the cutting room floor. But I mean, that one's got uh, some really impressive explorations. Uh, you know, for it, it draws on Cocteau, you know, the kind of imagery of uh, sort of death and rebirth. You know, the prisoner is in a sense, uh, is revealed the sense is already dead. And you've got to ask, is he dead in other senses as well? Is this the afterlife? Um, and, um, you know, but also there's some interesting gender things. It's one of the uh, few stories with a female number two. And in this one, it's, uh, you know, a very gender queer female number two. She dresses in male drag. She uh, plays Peter Pan and she's in what's almost subtextually a kind of a romantic rivalry between uh, with the prisoner over another woman. And so, uh, you know, this is uh, very bold stuff for 1967. Um, I think on top of that, I'd also say uh, um, the schizoid man is uh, a key favorite of mine, just because, uh, you know, there, it really takes this theme of duplicates and, uh, you know, takes it to the uh, final, uh, the, you know, just ratchets it up to unbearable levels, you know, at uh, times the viewer, you know, finds themselves uh, questioning whether the prisoner really is who he thinks he is, because, I mean, for people, you know, it's an episode where a uh, exact duplicate of the prisoner turns up and yeah. uh, has all his traits, and the prisoner finds out he doesn't have all his traits, and suddenly he's changed handedness, that yeah. uh, his favorite foods are no longer his favorite foods, and he likes other foods, and so he starts questioning who he is, you know, he starts... Uh, you know, and it just gets uh, so uh, just the tension just mounts and mounts, uh, and so to the to the point where there's a final reveal. But uh, really, it's just so cleverly done. Well, it seems that uh, within those fourteen other episodes, there are related episodes. Uh, when you look at uh, Living in Harmony, the girl who is deaf, and the one where he switches bodies uh, again with when when he was off filming Not a film. The yeah, yeah, uh, they're sort of like the very Franz Kafkian type, they're, they're, they're even out there for the prisoner. Then there are, the, I think there are three episodes where he escapes. We talked about the first one, Chimes of Bin, Big Ben, Many Happy Returns. And uh, uh, then there's, a, there's the one where he said, I'm going to come back and wipe you, the village off the face of the earth or something. There's, I think, three episodes where he escapes and comes back full circle and he's, he's you know, he's caught. Uh, then there are ones... Um, that are really you know, nothing else. That they're mind fucks. A, B, and C is is a real yeah. mind fuck. Um, yeah. You know, uh, the general. There, there we get. They want to fuck. It seems with the rest of the world. The, the you know, it, it's the classic. You know, the big you know room size computer of the 1950s, 60s. You know, Forb in the uh, Colossus, the Forbin project kind of computer take over the world. Um, are there? Do you do you also see sort of like? Uh, any meaning or any connection between certain episodes, uh, you know, in thematically like that, Fiona? You know, in, in the, the, yeah. the mind fucks, the, the, the yeah. circular coming back to the village, even though he thinks he's escaped, you know? I'd argue you're right, you know, and uh, there's some uh, episodes that are kind of more conventional spy series, you know, they're, they're treated more straight, you know, as a bit of a spy, a spy series with a bit of an original twist. And there's some that, uh, yeah, are just really, really out there. And there are others that uh, really, uh, you know, kind of milk the uh, whole questions about uh, identity and, uh, uh, you know, who, who we are and what they are. But the thing is, though, that, uh, you know, there's kind of, um, you know, there, there's uh, blurring and blending between them. So, for instance, I would say, do not forsake me, oh, my darling, is uh, in a lot of ways a pretty straightforward spy story. You know, it's, uh, uh, you know, very... The, the one thing that really puts it in the other categories is the fact that, uh, you know, the prisoner swaps brains with somebody else, you know, so or swaps egos with somebody else. And it's uh, in the straight spy series, you know, there's some, uh, you know, they like to play with it a bit, like the um, use of stock footage and uh, things in, uh, you know, um, 
Oh, gosh. Mine comes back. Not the Chimes of Big Ben, the other one, the one with Mrs. Butterworth. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. But, yeah. But anyway, he, uh, you know, where, uh, you know, you start uh, saying, you know, uh, it's it's almost like it's looking at the spy series of the time and saying, you know, kind of, uh, you know, let, let's have a bit of fun with this. You know, let's uh, let, let's play, uh, you know. I mean, one of the things I think that keeps The Prisoner fresh is that uh, it's a very playful series. It's, uh, you know, for all it's dealing with very serious and weighty themes, uh, you know, it's also at the same time, you know, uh, enjoying them, messing with them. Yeah. You know, A, B, and C, again, you know, one of the key moments is the moment where he sort of realizes that they're fucking with his mind and he starts taking control of that. You know, he starts uh, fucking with their um, uh, their dream scenarios and uh, like having lucid, you know, it's like having a lucid dream. He starts changing the party and uh, dancing with uh, the person who's supposed to be interrogating him and uh, shouting, it's dreamy, you know, and uh, just... So, uh, yeah, you know, um, yes, I'd say you can kind of roughly classify those episodes, but uh, they also, the series itself, uh, draws connections between them. Yeah. Two of my favorite episodes, and I'll, I'll throw this to Dean, is where the prisoner actually outthinks himself. One is Checkmate, where uh, he thinks that he's, he's figured out a system to tell, tell who the good guys and the bad guys are, but he falls victim to his own uh, mm. his own machinations when one of the people he's enlisted thinks that he's part of, of the village and out to get him. And then my favorite one, and my, probably my favorite ending other than the three, uh, the, the, the last two episodes, my favorite ending is where he's, he prevents the assassination of one of the number twos and he, he, he take, Oh no, no, I guess, I guess it must, no, it must be, uh, it must be, uh, the one uh, where uh, it's the duplicate because he kills the duplicate and he gets in the, he gets in the helicopter and he, he, he's about to take off, but he makes one mistake that the number two picks up on him when he talks about uh, his supposed girlfriend or wife, but uh, she died like a, a year or so before. Um, uh, so the, the hero doesn't win here uh, in most, most of the I mean, not only is he frust frustrated by the end of each episode where he can't get away, but he sometimes is his own worst enemy. Is, what is your take on that, Dean? Well, um, part of that... Uh... Uh, comes from the fact that I think he doesn't know who whose captors are. He doesn't know if it's his own side, if it's you know some some part or some uh, cadre or some some unknown department of British intelligence, or if it's the Soviets or some unknown. Uh, so he's constantly at at. Uh, and it's with sense as to what he's doing there. You know, they, you know, vigorously keep prying for information, but no one ever states what the information is they want. Um, and he never, you know, he never states it. And we assume that it's, you know, that it's a secret uh, that has to do with the designation. But again, it's never overtly stated that the case. Uh, but I think uh, for him, uh, you know, his ultimate goal is to escape, but uh, in, in doing so, he has to know who he's escaping from. And that's, you know, that's the quantity in himself in your previous through the whole thing. So, Fiona, uh, let's talk about the, the penultimate and the final episode. The, the second to last episode is Once Upon a Time. The final one is Fallout, and uh, mm. um, I think that Once Upon a Time is the single best episode of the seventeen. Um, uh, it's it's basically the the most well known of the number twos, Leo McKern, in his second of three performances. He's, he's in uh, uh, Chimes of Big Ben, and then the final two, um, and it's just it's just a really intense uh, grilling. I mean. They obviously couldn't show real torture on on television in those days, but it, it's the closest you can get to psychological torture. Um, and I think it's just a bravura performance from both McKern and McGowan. Uh, what's your take on the penultimate episode? Uh, yeah, well, it's uh, it, it, it's the closest the prisoner comes to doing a uh, 1960s avant-garde play, and I know people have actually staged it as a, a stage play. You know, it's just these two actors 
on a set with minimal props. You know, they couldn't even have done it on a bare prop. It's all just characterization. And yeah, you know, in a way, I think it would have uh, made it diminished its power if there had been actual physical torture. You know, it is uh, just about the psychological power, these two personalities clashing. And yet, you know, kind of midway through, you know, uh, the, the table's turning, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the prisoner, uh, you know, first succumbing to, uh, you know, the, uh, the village. And then, but, but also, I mean, talking about uh, uh, how, the, uh, you know, the, the series and its question of identity, there's the fact that their, uh, their personalities seem to merge as part of this process. You know, initially, two's got the upper hand, but you also get things like, um, you know, the prisoner goes through a sequence where he thinks he's a, uh, a pilot in World War II. Now, McGowan, you know, and by extension, the prisoner, so who shares a lot of his characteristics. And the same been, birth date. Yeah. It's, it's established. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, would have been too young. But Leo McCurran is old enough to have been an RAF pilot. So, you know, the prisoner is starting to share number two's experiences, and number two's story, and they both you know, went to public school, clearly. So, uh, you know, the school, uh, the school child experiences uh, come in there. And then at the end, you know, kind of it's like the two personalities wrestle. And then finally, the prisoner gets the upper hand. And uh, when he says die, uh, number two dies, you know. So uh, you've got this, uh, but you've also got, you know, the uh, referencing to Shakespeare going on in there, the idea that it's themed around the seven ages of man. And uh, you can watch that happening, you know, kind of from childhood to young adulthood to older adulthood and finally through till uh, till death. You know, it's following a human lifetime with all the stresses and strains that entails. But at the end of it, coming out the end and the other side of it. So, again, the question is, you know, is this uh, life and death? Is this uh, the prisoner, uh, you know, about... Uh, uh, life and the afterlife, and uh, in one uh, one connection we haven't mentioned so far, but I think it might be worth mentioning is uh, Philip K. Dick, you know, who uh, uh, was also, you know, when you're talking about, you know, things like, uh, you know, um, a checkmate and so forth, you know, uh, you can see connections uh, with uh, things like a scanner darkly, where you have uh, somebody who is a undercover policeman who's so undercover that he's actually reporting on himself you know so uh, you know although there was no direct connection you can see a clear mindset there between uh, uh, two products of late 60s culture uh so dean what is your take on the penultimate episode and the acting of mckern and mcgoo in there um uh, well i guess so what you only said um one of the things I, I tried to address in my graphic novel was what that last, those last two episodes meant. Uh, uh, I had to, uh, and it's partly, I was requesting that I think they, if I was going to address any of the episodes that I need to try to, try to come up with a way to shoehorn those things into some kind of continuity. And so my contention was that the the penultimate episode, but more 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 importantly, the last episode is part part of the final interrogation, and was uh, had to do with uh, uh, hallucinogenic drugs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and that much of the uh, much of what is seen more in the final episode is uh, hallucination. Um, but as far as the penultimate episode goes. Uh, I was fascinated by the uh, by the by, uh, uh, the great great number six and most importantly number two today to the schoolboy days. Uh, that seems that was to me very surreal. And that that has made use of very easy props to to acquire to uh, put on the set, um, but also very uh, ubiquitous, almost uh, passing to Alice in Wonderland. So I want to talk, though, um, about, again, the Drake uh, and, and the prisoner possibly being one. There is a scene, and I know when I reviewed this show about 15, 16 years ago, if you Google, I forget, if you Google my name and the prisoner, uh, in the American release of 
of uh, the DVDs in 02 or 04, whenever it was really first released fully. When you listen to it, there's a scene where Leo McKern is number two, says, I'll see you in the morning. And he either says Drake or break. But when you slow it down and you listen to it, it's clearly a D. And when you see the lips of McKern, he is saying his lips are apart. When you say D, it's Drake. When you say B, the lips are together. Buh. So he clearly says Drake. And and the, and when you listen to it, and I've had a number of people who have no idea about the prison listener, they all say it's D. So I'm just wondering, uh, was that one of those little uh, things that one of these people, Fiona, who insisted that it was Drake, put in there and that just slipped by McGowan? Um, well, no. I mean, the problem is that uh, whether uh, if, if, if McKern said uh, uh, Drake, it's definitely scripted as, scripted as break. And, uh, you know, as uh, uh, McGowan would uh, not have allowed it to go out if he thought it was Drake. Uh -huh. So if it... Uh, does you know slowing it down if, if slowing it down it comes out as drake then it's a case of somebody else sneaking it past mcgoon yeah. because as i said you know in the script you know it's uh, definitely not uh, his intention uh. um you know i would say it doesn't prove or disprove anything uh, one way or the other uh, uh, whether uh, you know whether he does since as i said some uh, uh, it could be read either way, and some extra canonical works uh, do. Uh, sorry, we know what her favorite episodes are. Uh, you know. Uh, but, uh, well, let me just ask you, since you lived in in, in Britain, um, here in America, we go on a break. We don't go in a break. So, yes. do, do Brits do Brits say that they're going to go in a break? Well, the thing is, and this is why uh, you know uh, what North Americans call recess is called the morning break. Uh -huh. or the afternoon break. I mean, this is, I mean, straight away, uh, as soon as the, the, the rumors that it was uh, Drake um, kind of get started, really, is uh, not long after the uh, North American broadcast. And uh, it has been argued that some of this is because, uh, you know, um, in the uh, 60s, you know, not, uh, less globalization, you know, less familiarity with different dialects. So people uh, did not realize that morning break would be an appropriate way for the teacher to refer to what uh, North American would call recess. Huh, okay. So, uh, Dean, uh, let's talk about the, the final episode called Fallout. And it's interesting. It's two words, because uh, if it was nuclear fallout, because there's nuclear bomb symbolism, it would be one word. It's nuclear fallout, one word. So it's fall out, uh, and let's just do the spoiler here. Uh, it seems at the end, after th a whole uh, show trial, shall we call it, they, they revive the Leo McKern character, a character that appeared a couple of episodes earlier as a gun shooter, comes back as, as the kid. Uh, there's the whole mm -hmm. philosophical questions of authority, uh, rights, this kind of thing. Uh, but in the end, when number one, uh, number two has has won the right to finally meet number one. He goes up into uh, this the cone of, uh, I guess it's a nuclear silo or whatever it might be, and he sees number one holding a globe, and it turns out it's the prisoner, uh, seeing a reflection of himself, basically. Um, so that's that's been debated a long time, presumably, and you know, what uh, McGowan claimed was that this caused a, a lot of ruckus in England when that was finally revealed. What is your take on the final episode, Dean? Well, um, again, um, I think the, the, the final episode has more to do with uh, kind of a dream and phase of, um, than any actual canonical uh, event. Uh, when he finds, when he sees himself as number one, he, that, it, that to me seems to be the message that we're all our own number one. It, no matter what number we see ourselves as, but somehow number one is the ultimate ego. And I know it's been argued that, you know, that uh, all, you know, in the end, that he was, he was number one all the time. Uh, that was in one interpretation I've heard uh, reiterated several times. Uh, but uh, again, it's, uh, it's so much so much of that episode is a fantasia uh, and uh, an Aaron Gothic 
take on Siri. So you can't uh, interpret it as a, uh, uh, well, I, I, recycling, can interpret those events as literal events that, that happen to them. Uh, because they all seem to happen within his mind, even the, the harking back to the gunfighter from the from uh, living in harmony. And the very uh, and the very end the very end of that episode, he's he's driving away like it's the beginning of another episode. Yeah, yeah. So it's exactly uh, the of the beginning of the first. So Fiona, do do you look at uh, the final episode? as a manifesto in favor of free will, or is this uh, uh, the exact opposite? Since he looks like, uh, since he's driving down the same road in the same sports car, it looks like the whole goddamn thing's gonna happen again, and it, it's it's determinism. So is, yeah. is this free will or determinism, or does it matter? Well, I think the series is quite cleverly has its cake and eats it too on that. As you said, there's this cyclical aspect because there he is, uh, back in his car, driving back to uh, uh, presumably go back into uh, the village again. So uh, you've got that. You've also got, uh, although, uh, you know, in some ways it almost seems like a celebration of the individual, you've also got things undermining it. Like, um, you know, when he finally finds number one, you know, who is, of course, not just one, but I, you know, uh, I is uh, himself, but uh, I is also uh, irrational and mad and jumps about and spouts gibberish and uh, sets off the bomb whilst uh, Carmen Miranda sings, I, I, I love you very much. So is that a way of saying that individualism can go too far? If you become too much of an individual, then, uh, you know, it's nonsense. And yet at the same time, you know, if... Uh, community goes too far, you know, if uh, it turns into the village, something that looks uh, pretty, but is ultimately um, a force for uh, oppression. And then, uh, you know, I mean, one of the interesting things about that ending is the context it's in. A lot of uh, stories around the same time uh, were, um, you know, ending in a, um, a descent into anarchy. Like I've just uh, reviewed uh, uh, the film Casino Royale from 1967 for uh, the website Galactic Journey, and I think one of the telling things is that by the end, at the end of the story, it uh, everything just goes completely mad. Everybody is named James Bond. There's a the, a fist fight in a casino that involves cowboys and Indians and the Keystone Cops and uh, dogs and seals and well, uh, uh, Woody Woody uh, Allen's version of yeah. Casino Royale, you know, where yeah. he's little Jimmy Bond. I mean, that that was yeah. the same era. Yeah, and spoilers, you know, uh, the uh, Woody Allen is also the, uh, you know, the, the, the Dr. No figure. So, you know, you've got uh, this kind of saying, you know, is, uh, um, you know, James Bond villains are just really inadequate, uh, you know, and, uh, but it just seems like uh, people, it was a time when uh, people were saying, has society gone too far? You know, uh, but uh, but on, on the other hand, are we going too far in seeking out the cult of the individual? You know, is the clash between the individual and society ultimately going to lead to um, not just nuclear Armageddon, which of course Casino Royale also ends with, but uh, um, social anarchy, as represented by the bomb. So, um, before, uh, I just want to get on one more point, and then we'll do a final uh, segment talking about. Uh, sort of the meaning and, and the, the the influence of the prisoner down through the line. Um, I see that there were several unproduced episodes. You talked about them wanting, yeah, I think it, I read somewhere 25 or 27, then it was the 22, then McGowan finally put his foot down and said no more than 17. Um, uh, four of them that I see listed here in in a sec section on Wikipedia called The Outsider, Ticket to Eternity, Friend or Foe, Don't Get Yourself Killed. Do either you or Dean, uh, do you know anything about these episodes and why they were were rejected? Were, were any of them produced and then dropped midway? Dean, how about you? Do you know anything? I don't know anything about those at all. Okay. How about you, Fiona? This is my special subject. Okay. Uh, we cover these extensively in the book and also... Uh, I can also recommend Rob Faircliffe's Prisoner Script Book, which uh, also contains the scripts to the episodes that weren't made but don't have scripts. Now, the question of why they weren't uh, made is a bit more opaque uh, in that um, 
I mean, it's 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 a real interesting thing looking at uh, public television series like Doctor Who and Blake Seven versus independent ones like The Prisoner because. Uh, Doctor Who and Blake Seven have got documentation up to here, you know, you've got uh, memos, you've got bills, you've got just absolutely everything you could want, and the prisoner, there's just no paper trail, you know, you have to guess at a lot of things, and in particular because McGowan uh, and then first Mark Steen and then uh, Tomlin were uh, kind of largely making it up, uh, in, you know, making it in their own image, as it were, you know, I think a lot of it just kind of happened in conversation. I mean, there's some episodes where you can kind of guess why uh, they um, uh, they weren't. I mean, um, for instance, if I can get to a ticket to eternity, that one uh, um, focused around the idea of a church in the village, which is interesting. But uh, you know, showing organized religion was one of uh, Maguin's uh, no-nos, and uh, friend or foe, uh, which was another one. Uh, well, um, you know, it was a little racially insensitive in some ways. So, uh, again, I can see uh, the team saying uh, maybe not. Um, the Outsider, um, you know, would have been kind of, it, it's in line with a lot of the prisoners' themes, and it was written by a very experienced writer. But um, it, it does also, um, it, it, it's, it's also very technically, it would have been an expensive episode to make at a time when, uh, you know, they were... Um, you know, worried about uh, the budget, uh, the, the budget, and also, uh, you know, some of so the, the treatment of women. Uh, you know, is uh, a little bit uh, again. You know, McGowan, who uh, always emphasized, you know, kind of no misogyny, would have, would have been in some ways kind of saying, let's rewrite this one. Um, yeah, don't get yourself killed um, is another one looking at kind of re-education and uh, you know, kind of um, state-run uh, 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 learning. So, um, but again, um, you know, you could, you could sort of see, um, you know, it seems to have been a pretty early story in the, uh, in the commissioning process and some things seem to be uh, needing to work out. And it also bears a lot of resemblances to things like uh, Checkmate and the General, which, uh, you know, may have made people uh, say uh, uh, maybe not. There is, however, I mean, one thing that's really interesting is that there's an escape committee in the village in that one. Um, you know, like like in Colvitz. So, uh, you know, uh, that would have been a fun thing to explore. And I mean, maybe that's uh, one that could have, um, you know, been rewritten. But, uh, you know, it's um, at the end, you know, kind of um, it, it was sort of McGowan and by that point, Tomlin sort of saying, you know, yes or no. And so it was uh, down to their decision. Before we wrap up and uh, I'll get your final thought, thoughts on why uh, uh, The Prisoner is a great show and should be watched by newbies and oldies. Um, I want to talk about several other uh, influences before and after the show and see if any of this resonates with you. Um, you said, Fiona, you, uh, and you've written about The Star Lost, and that's an interesting show in that it's, it's not like The Prisoner overtly, but you have uh, three protagonists there is a very controlled structure. It's a, it's a, an arc. Uh, it's a, it's a starship. They go to different little miniature worlds within this huge starship. Uh, um, do you see any connections between those two shows? Even though the prison is obviously of greater quality. Yeah, I mean, it could have been. You know, I mean, the uh, the the tragedy of the Star Lost is it could really have been a very good show, and the premise, you know, is fantastic. And as you say, very prisoner esque. This idea that, uh, uh, for those who don't know, it uh, was intended to be a space opera set on a generation ship, but uh, three protagonists kind of come out of a sort of an agriculture, what they think is, you know, kind of a nineteenth um, century agricultural community, only to find that in fact they're on a generation ship. And spoilers: the uh, the ship's crew are dead, and they're on a collision course with the sun. So you know the uh, rest of the series spins off on the idea that they've got to find people in other domes and convince them that a they're on a generation ship, and b this generation ship is doomed. So you know you can see that again with the idea of an individual who's got the truth and, uh, you know, and yet people won't listen to them, but also that uh, you could have had a series that changed format week on week. You know, we could have had a Western one week and a uh, cop show the next week. Uh, and in some ways it does kind of try to do this. It does try to do sort of the difference in format every week. It just kind of, um, I think its ambition exceeded its grasp. Yeah. 
Uh, Dean, think, oh, oh, yes. oh, no, go ahead, Dion, finish your thought. I think the prisoners had a wider uh, impact on popular culture. I mean, uh, in some ways, it's almost like uh, something like Metropolis or the films of Hitchcock in that, uh, you know, it, it's become an adjective that people, uh, you know, will uh, look at a series and say, oh, this is prisoner-esque or prisoner-like. And, uh, you know, exactly what they're saying in the same way. And the imagery just blends into the uh, popular culture. So if somebody just walks walks by in a piped jacket, you know, suddenly like everybody knows, even if you haven't seen the series, everybody knows what it means. Yeah. Uh, Dean, uh, you're probably familiar with the sci-fi novel Logan's Run and then the film, but few people remember a TV show in the late 70s with Gregory Harrison that was in it. And this is another very prisoner-esque type show because they're trying to escape from their bubbled-in city and they're sending quote-unquote sandmen to try to bring him back every episode. I think it only add 10 out of maybe 13 episodes or something. Uh, have you ever seen that episode? And do you see any influence of the prisoner in there? Well, I saw that, that TV show when it, uh, when it originally aired, uh, but I haven't seen it since. Uh, and the movie, uh, I, I think you could make the argument that, again, a uh, quasi-utopian society in this village purports to be for its inmates a utopia of some kind. Uh, very few of the prisoners in the village uh, regard themselves as prisoners or at least overtly regard themselves as prisoners. And many were uh, content or apparently content, but they were made to feel content by the uh, by their wards. Um, so I think trying to escape uh, this quasi utopian society. Uh, uh, yeah, that has a parallel to me, but uh, I mean that uh, uh, I don't remember the TV series that well. Uh, so, Fiona, do you have any? Did you ever see that show, the, the Logan's Run TV series? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Like DC Fontana, yeah. Yeah, Dorothy Fontana, yeah. Um, yeah. Now, another show that uh, that has to be mentioned uh, as sort of possibly a precursor is uh, the famed show The Fugitive with David Jansen. And, uh, um, well, I mean, uh, most people are probably going to know that. How about you, uh, Fiona? Do you see any influences of The Fugitive being brought to fruition in The Prisoner? Um, I do, uh, though also... Uh... You know, I would say that in some ways that's um, something the prisoner is uh, referencing. You know, the fact that one of the ways the, pr uh, you know, the prisoner, as I think we've both been implying, you know, one of the ways part of its power is that it comes to you with a very familiar format, the spy series, you know, the, and then subverts it. And uh, so, you know, if you're just tuning in as a regular viewer, you know, and watching the prisoner, you're comforted by the fact that it's uh, a familiar format. Um, and that format is like The Fugitive, you know, the story of a man in a uh, scenario that's very easily explained in the title sequence. And um, the story changes week on week as uh, the, uh, the title character encounters different people, goes to different towns, has to do different things. And then, uh, but at the end of the story, there's always the policeman pursuing him. But then also, I mean, one of the other connections that's maybe uh, less obvious is uh, you know, the final episode, you know, the fugitive has an ending, a final episode in which everything changes, in which um, he he catches up with the one-armed man, in which, uh, you know, the policeman uh, realizes that uh, the prisoner was innocent, so the fugitive was innocent all along, and, um, you know, we end with him actually starting to rebuild a new life. Uh, so, uh, you know, there it is. Uh, there, the you know, the idea of a final episode that uh, brings a series round full circle and, uh uh, concludes uh, its themes. And I think that last episode, other than the MASH finale in 1983, yeah. I think that's the, the highest episode rated here in the U.S. Um, let me ask you about The Fugitive. Dean, do you see any uh, Fugitive in The Prisoner? Yeah, I would say that I would echo the same thing as Jonas. It, it, it followed the format that was popular in television at the time, and it, it allowed... Um, uh, you know, man, one man against a system, uh, which was basically the, you know, one of the major things that both the prison and the people did. It's a uh, way to frustrate the system, ways to escape the system, ways the system, you know, uh, 
oppressed and uh, pursued uh, the, uh, the protagonist. So I want to mention two other series before we get to your final thoughts, uh, both that are, are not really well known. And I'll start with you, Dean. Um, in 1965, an actor named Frank Converse in America was part of a series called Coronet Blue. Uh, it was about a man. Uh, we see a very similar uh, setup to Prisoner. Uh, and we see it uh, in the beginning, uh, the, the promo for the show or the intro to the show each episode. Um, a, a guy seems to be a spy working for Russia. He he has an argument with one of his commanders. He's knocked overboard, and then he washes up onto a pier, and he has lost his memory. And it only lasted, I, I think, only like three or four episodes, five episodes maybe aired uh, out of 13 made because there was like a two-year gap between the making of the show and 1967 when it aired. It was made in 65. And it, it's very prisoner-esque. It's a little bit more realistic, set in the real world and real world locations. But it's a it's a really fascinating show. Have you ever seen Coronet Blue or even heard of it? No. Yeah, because the only words he remembers, uh, the only thing he remembers of his past life is the word Coronet Blue, which presumably the 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 maker of the show said was the name of his Russian core. Have you ever heard of that show, Fiona? No, I'm going to look it up. This sounds great. Buy the DVD series. It's 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 right. available. It's 13 episodes. It's really good. And Frank Converse is, you know, a, a, he, he's known in America as a good, solid act. He might be most well-known in Canada for the Anne of Green Gables sequel. He played the love interest of uh, Megan Follows. But uh, mm. I, 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 would, I would say look it up. And now the, the other series, uh, series uh, show I want to mention to both of you as being influenced by The Prisoner, uh, before we wrap up, uh, is 1995's Nowhere Man with Bruce Greenwood, another Canadian actor. It aired on, I guess it was the UPN channel. It debuted the same night, I think, as Star Trek Voyager. Bruce Greenwood plays a guy, and it's, it's almost the exact inverse of the prisoner. His life is stripped away from him. He's not put in a prison, mm -hmm. but he his wife turns out not to be his wife. His parents may or not be his parents. Uh and it only ran for 25 episodes one season. Um, Dean, have you have you ever seen or heard of the show? No, again, I think I've seen it. Okay. How about you, Fiona? Have you ever seen or heard Nowhere Man? Um, I've heard of it. I never actually watched it. There was a, believe it or not, there was a period in my life, mostly in the uh, 90s, when I actually didn't have a television because I was... Uh, Okay. Um, a, a in university and B moving house frequently, so uh, you know it. Uh, I just kind of caught series as and when, but yeah, no, it's it is interesting though how many series have kind of taken the format or similar formats or run right. changes on it. I mean, like very recently, of course, you've got One Division, which I would say uh, you know uh, has you know a lot of connections with the prisoner, but kind of applying it to this. Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the Disney Marvel uh, uh, films. Mm -hmm. We are, uh, in, it, in it, he plays a photojournalist who takes a photo of a hanging in a central, mm -hmm. an unnamed Central American company, uh, country. Uh, a group called The Organization is after him. Uh, mm -hmm. And slowly, there are some excellent episodes. Like The Prisoner, some of the later episodes, you can tell they knew they were being canceled. So it's and and the ending is 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 not the strongest because they they had to wrap up. But Coronet Blue, thirteen episodes. That No End Man, twenty five. I would encourage you, Fiona, if you want to Prisoner yes. to, to to look into that. So let's wrap up, uh, Dean. Uh, your final thoughts. Um, for someone who has never heard of The Prisoner, just like some of these shows that are even more obscure. Why should someone who's never heard of The Prisoner watch it, and why is it great, Dean? Well, uh, The Prisoner uh, bridged a couple different genres in terms of its uh, overt uh, categorization. So it was part spy theory, part science fiction, um, and anyone who has that appetite, uh, either or both of those genres, would certainly find it uh, uh, an enjoyable watch. Uh, as far as um, what things were there, I mean, the, the things that are within the prison uh, that people might be familiar with, things that, you know, Orwell explored and Calvin explored. So I think uh, uh, anyone uh, interested in those things, uh, 
we certainly find a, a lot a lot of food for thought in, in the prison. So Fiona, let me ask you then, for someone who has not watched the prison or doesn't know of it, why should they watch it, and why do you think it's great? Well, first of all, because, as I said, you know, it's one of these series that uh, once you start watching it, you're going to say, oh, oh, you'll suddenly, suddenly a whole lot of uh, references, ideas, things that make it out of the wider culture make sense. But I would also say uh, at the moment, uh, you know, I think because it's got an awful lot to say about uh, politics and the individual versus the community. I mean, uh, one of the things that really struck me about the village when I first viewed it I mean, I thought, you know, here's this man and he's trapped. He's a prisoner in a village. It must be horrible. But then, you know, watching it, I was like, the village is beautiful. You know, it's seductive. You know, you want to, you watch it and you want to go on holiday there. It's uh, filmed in the Port Marion where it was filmed as a holiday location. And uh, yeah, you want to, you feel like you want to spend time in the village. And then you realize that if you do that, you know, if you do, you're, um, you know, say you want to spend time in prison camp because it's just a prison camp, uh, where people are being tortured, mind controlled, uh, um, confused, you know, and at a time when people, uh, you know, are maybe uh, looking for, uh, you know, an easy answer, a, a uh, you know, a, a soft, uh, you know, comforting message, you know, it can be a powerful thing to remind people that the comforting messages are, uh, can be dangerous. So, uh, you know, I think, um, yeah, you know, it's, uh, worth yeah i would say uh, uh you know if you haven't seen the prisoner do sit down watch it enjoy it you can see it in any order except for those three episodes you know pick an episode uh say, pick one that sounds appealing to you watch it see how you see how you go the prisoner is um eminently watchable today i, I found i watched it again in its entirety about 30 years ago uh this was fun and i was surprised how at how well it held up yeah uh, you know, but, you Much know, better than the remake ten years ago. Sadly, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to thank I want to thank yeah. both of you. Uh, I will link to deanmata.com. I'll also link uh, uh, to a doctor of many things the the blog uh, by Fiona. Or if you have any other links. Uh, so thank you very much for a good conversation. Okay. Thank you very much.